Getting started with our conservation webinar, I'm Holly Kirkendall, National Technology Specialist for NRCS's East National Technology Support Center. I'm pleased to turn the webinar over to David Lamb. David is the National Soil Health Team Leader for NRCS's Soil Health Division. David, you may now begin. Okay, and thank you, uh, Holly, for that wonderful introduction. And I want to tell you, uh, thank everybody for joining in today. I think it's going to be a very exciting presentation. I had a chance to hear uh, Dr. Montgomery's presentation several years ago at the Soil and Water Conservation Society meeting and uh, also had a chance to meet him last summer in person here in Greensboro, North Carolina. Dr. Montgomery is a professor of Earth and Science or Space Sciences at the University of Washington located in uh, Seattle and he has a BS in geology from Stanford and his PhD is in geomorphology from the University of California. Uh, he's an author of numerous books, one being uh, The uh, Dirt, The Erosion of Civilization, and the second one he's going to introduce this afternoon is called The Hidden Half of Nature, The Microbial Roots of Life and Health. And it's interesting that Ray Archuleta always says, that soil without biology is only geology, so we have a geologist who's going to be talking about the life in the soil. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Montgomery. Yeah, well, uh, thank you, David, and thank you all for listening in. It's, it's, a, it's a privilege to talk to you all today. I've been a, a major fan of the NRCS and the work that it does back from the Soil Conservation Service days when I read Topsoil and Civilization as an undergrad, and it got me thinking about the role of soil in human societies. So I'm going to give you a bit of an overview tour through these two books, Dirt and the Hidden Half of Nature, today. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, I obviously recommend the books to you. If you want to follow uh, the stuff that um, my wife and I, I my co-author on the second one, do, uh, our Twitter handle is up there on the screen. But I was asked uh, about a week ago, or a couple weeks ago, to give a talk at a conference in San Francisco and to open with the big picture of, you know, why soil conservation is important. And what I decided to do is open with this slide that shows Earth and Mars because, and ask the simple question, which planet would you rather live on, the one with soil or the one uh, known as Mars? <laughs> um, and soil we can look at, as, as you all know, as one of the great uh, resources that we have on this planet, you know, water and soil uh, make this place habitable. But if we look at the way that we've um, been treating soil over the last few centuries in particular, uh, there's great concern about um, the damage that we've been doing. David Pimentel's famous paper back from 1995 um, uh, argued that some 430 million hectares of arable lands had lost to soil degradation since the Second World War, and that's an area equivalent to about a third of all the cropland that we have on the planet. Um, and this is, this is a realization that I think is central to your guys' mission, uh, as is, I think, the idea of soil degradation that Rattan Lau back in 99 commented on, that the world's agricultural soils have already lost you know, 66 to 90 billion tons of carbon, mostly due to tillage. And these issues and these changes to soil on the surface of the earth is, is why somebody like myself, a geologist, would get involved in thinking about um, the long-term influence of soil on human civilizations uh, with the idea of looking at what kind of lessons can we learn from the past in terms of the importance of soil and soil erosion and soil degradation in particular on maintaining civilizations. And that's the, the, the approach that I took in the DIRT book, is trying to go back and read the archaeological literature, uh, try and integrate what had happened and what was the influence of soil erosion and degradation on ancient societies. And the first thing you run into when you start researching that perspective is the argument that it was deforestation that helped drive the soil erosion um, that contributed to the demise of societies around the world. Those, all those societies over on the right-hand side of the screen being placed, you know, a few of the places where people have made those connections. But I'm a, a, a geologist who grew up in the, the steeplands of Northern California and did my PhD work in the Oregon Coast Range places where um, you might expect large-scale soil erosion to have happened from forest clearing if it simply was deforestation or, or timber harvesting that was driving erosion that contributed to the demise of ancient societies. Uh, and it, it was, you notice pretty quickly that the trees grow back long before the soil disappears on any wholesale level. Sure, clear-cutting steep slopes increases the pace of landsliding, but it just doesn't pencil out in anywhere near in terms of the kind of soil loss that has been documented in the archaeological record in ancient societies. 
And that got me starting to think that, well, could it have been agricultural soil erosion and degradation that contributed to limiting the lifespan of civilizations? And obviously, if I'd come up with the answer of no, I probably would have written a different book. So, you know, just titling my uh, dirt book the way we have I've kind of telegraphed the answer. Um, and a lot of the details are in that book. But when you go and actually work through the archaeological studies, um, they show pretty clearly that erosion played a role in the demise of ancient civilizations, ranging from the Bronze Age societies of Neolithic Europe to classical Greece, Rome, the southern United States, Central America. Uh, the list goes on. There's societies in Asia, Pacific Islands. Um, and I tried to catalog as many as I could and weave the, the commonalities um, out through the dirt book. And the most fundamental commonality you can really see in that story is that the invention of the plow was far more the, the culprit in terms of ancient soil erosion than was the forester's ax. Um, and that the invention of the plow fundamentally altered the balance between soil production and soil erosion on our agricultural lands and dramatically increased the pace of soil erosion to the point where if you think about that balance, if you're removing something faster than you're replacing it, you're actually burning through it and running out of it. Uh, what kind of a time frame was actually involved in those processes, and could agricultural soil erosion pre uh, uh, proceed at a pace for which we can actually tie it to the longevity of human societies? That's the case that I investigated and tried to, tried to pull together. Um, I'm not going to uh, talk about lots of societies today. Uh, the, 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 there's a similar story, though, that comes out in culture after culture, in period of history after period of history, that classical Greece illustrates pretty well. Um, and in classical Greece, cycles of erosion and soil formation really began when, in the Bronze Age, the plow arrived from points uh, in Asia Minor to the east. Um, and this the scenario that I'm going to walk through in terms of the, the geoarchaeological evidence that's been put together for classical Greece um, is mirrored in, in other societies, but I like using classical Greece because both the geology and the archaeology were done in concert with one another uh, in integrated studies that tried to reconstruct what happened to the landscape of Greece uh, after the last ice age through through the present day. And Tiered Van Andels and Chris Runnels, a geologist and, a, and an archaeologist back in the 80s, put together this story where the next couple slides will show you cross sections of hillsides that they put together to show the transition in the Greek landscape that accompanied the agriculturalization, if I can perhaps invent a word, um, of that landscape. And so this first slide shows the open oak woodland of, of the uh, uplands in classical Greece. Um, where you've got the, the trees on there, and then the little vertical bars that are brown show you the soil on the hillsides is about a foot to three foot um, uh, thick, bedrock underneath, and then alluvial, alluvium down in the valley bottoms. Well, when agriculture, um, plow-based grain cultivation, spread up from the valley bottoms uh, up onto the hillsides, and I'll see if I can make the um, uh, pointer work here, but so it spread from the valley bottoms up onto the hillsides. It started off a cycle of erosion that, um, that stripped the soils off of the hillsides and piled it all up down in the valley bottoms. And you can still find agricultural implements from the Bronze Age up here on the rocky uh, slopes with just uh, scrubby maquis vegetation uh, today in places where we know that crops were grown in, in classical times. And if you think about the problem of growing food on a landscape, the thickness of the, well, the, the spatial distribution of the soil matters. If you take uh, the total volume of soil that's spread in a thin layer on a, on, a, on a landscape, blanketing the hillsides, and you pile it all up down in the valley bottoms, you're going to be able to grow food on a smaller portion of the, of the landscape. And classical Greece really illustrates well this tension between how farming started down in the valley bottoms, spread up onto the hillsides, uh, but once the soil was removed from the hillsides, they were not able to support as high a population as they were when they were able to farm the entire landscape. Um, what did this do to Greek society? Uh, the, one of the things I like about the Van Andels and Runnels work is, is they went ahead and tried to examine the human population density, so how many people there were um, on the landscape in various valleys of southern Greece, in this case the southern Argolid. And they looked at that population through time, from 6,000 BC over there on the left up to the modern age on the right. 
And they see an interesting pattern of a, of a rise in population in the Bronze Age and then a crash through the Dark Age between then and the age of classical Greece where the population rose again, a second crash in the Dark Age of the, um, of the, the, of the first millennium and then a rise to, to the modern age. Now, there's two really interesting aspects to this curve, and this is really the figure that when I found this researching dirt, it started to, the, the basic argument of the book started to gel in my mind because there's, there's two aspects to this curve, one of which is fairly trivial, and that is why does the amplitude of these cycles increase each, with each cycle? And pretty clearly, that's due to the development of technology. I mean, we have far better technology today in the modern age than they did back in the Bronze Age. So it's no mystery that you could grow more food per hectare of land to support a bigger population now than you did then. But what sets the periodicity? Why this, why this rise and crash, rise and crash and rise? And then, of course, the question of what happens off the right side of the graph. And is this an analog for, um, for societies in general? And what might we expect at a global level um, as well. There's very few places that you can point to where there's been three agricultural societies that occupied the same piece of land. Um, and this 1,000 this to 2,000 year sort of cyclicity is what got me really thinking about what's the relationship between the way that people treat their land and how long the land will be able to support human societies. Now, it turns out I'm not the first person to have thought of this. Plato, back in the... Um, uh, third, third, fourth century BC, noticed the problem of um, the Bronze Age soil erosion off the Greek landscape, and he wrote about it in one of his dialogues, where he wrote that the rich, soft soil has all run away, leaving the land nothing but skin and bone. But in those days, the damage had not taken place. The hills had high crests, the rocky plain of Phellus was covered with rich soil, and the mountains were covered by thick woods, of which there are some traces today. What Plato was looking at was um, evidence like things like um, oak trees um, and, and olive trees that were sitting up on soil pedestals around plowed fields. And he put together the idea that degradation of the soil had led to a reduction in, in harvests that meant that the population of Greece was lower, which meant that they couldn't mount the armies they needed to protect themselves from people coming from the east. Uh, he was, in other words, I think the first person who really put together the idea that the way that people treat their land will shape how long that land is able to support their society. Um, he didn't get a lot of credit for this idea in the long run, though. It was, it was written in one of his dialogues where he talked about the, the story of Atlantis. It wasn't viewed as the most credible uh, story from antiquity. But I think he was actually a pretty good observer of nature and was really onto something in noticing the Bronze Age soil erosion event in the days before classical Greece when he was alive. So I'm going to skip over <clears throat> a whole mess of societies that I talked about in terms of like Rome and North Africa. Um, but I'll just mention that if we look at some of the societies in the Middle East where the, the greatest damage to their soil has been done for the longest time and that they haven't recovered, we're looking at places like Syria and Libya, places that are not exactly um, uh, stable points of, of prosperity today. But if we look at the history of our own country and look at soil erosion um, in the U.S., I think there's some very interesting ties to the way it shaped the development of our country um, that I go into in the book, but I'll just share a little bit with you here in terms of the magnitude of historical erosion in the Piedmont region of the American Southeast. So going from Virginia up here all the way down to Alabama and looking at, at the hill country of the Piedmont, that upland terrain where, um, where soil erosion off the hillsides would be expected to um, uh, start when the soil was broken and, and it was first plowed, uh, and if agricultural soil erosion proceeded faster than um, soil was formed, how much would actually be lost how fast? And Trimble and Mead put a lot of this work together, uh, and there's been more recent work on cosmogenic isotopes that have it's been very interesting in this regard too. But I like this one graph because it shows the magnitude of historical soil loss in the Piedmont region since the colonial era. And you'll notice that, that most of it is four to 10 inches. Essentially, the A horizon's been stripped off the landscape. And I was out in North Carolina not too long ago looking at some farms with Ray Archuleta and, and basically was like, where'd the A horizon go? They're farming the B horizon. Um, there was widespread loss of the, the topsoil in this region. Uh, and you know, four to 10 inches in a couple hundred years across a, a landscape of this extent starts to put into perspective what could the Romans or the Greeks have done with a thousand-year run at it with much similar technologies in terms of their plows. They're a little different, 
but not all that different. Um, and here we're starting to get into the realm where we act, can actually look at measurements and look at the pace of things. And stripping the A horizon off of a, a pretty broad region of the country in a few hundred years starts to make the case that maybe this idea of widespread regional soil loss uh, really did have an impact on ancient societies, let alone our own society. Well, George Washington was one of the first people that I think really recognized um, the long-term impact of the soil degradation on the eastern seaboard, the original agricultural powerhouse of, of the country. And he, he ca captured it nicely in a uh, 1796 letter to Alexander Hamilton, where he wrote that a few years more of increased sterility will drive the inhabitants of the Atlantic states westward for support, or as if they were taught how to improve the old instead of going in pursuit of, of new and productive soils, they would make these acres, which now scarcely yield them anything, turn out beneficial to themselves. What Washington was arguing very explicitly in this letter that was actually published about 100 years after his death, but, but um, captured at the end of the 18th century, he was arguing that for American society to remain prosperous with the way that we were farming in colonial times and degrading soil on the eastern seaboard, we would have to spread across the Appalachians to the fertile soils of the Midwest. He was predicting, in other words, our, our, the, our country's expand, westward expansion a century before the idea of manifest destiny was sort of thrown around by historians. He was looking at it in terms of a nation of farmers needing access to undegraded fertile soils because of what we had done on the eastern seaboard. And if you look at the um, soils today, this basically um, shows you the difference between a forest soil in North Carolina and a, and a conventional tobacco um, uh, field that I um, photographed for a, a NOVA special that was on last um, uh, November. I think it was the third episode of Making North America. They realized that they had left soils out of the picture, and we ended up doing a short segment for them. Um, but essentially, if you look at the, the soil on the left here is the analog for um, something more like what the native soil was like, and the soil on the right being what happens after a few decades of tobacco cultivation. The story is clear in terms of soil degradation. Now, I want to turn to picking on my own home state of Washington for a few minutes here, um, in part because this photograph of the Palouse from back in 1970, it's the, the eastern part of the state uh, with uh, beautiful list soils, but this photograph captures really well why a geologist like myself would view agricultural soil erosion as a really big long-term problem. All those little channels across the, the hill there, those little rills, you could just plow right across them. They're um, easily wiped out with a single pass of a, of a plow, but they really add up over time in terms of net movement of soil. And how much so? Uh, this picture from also from the Palouse from 1961 taken by Vern Kaiser shows you a, um, uh, on the, a cliff that developed in the margin of a field around a fence that is um, enclosing a water cistern that the farmer didn't want to plow over. And so in 1911, when he first broke, broke the sod in this region, the soil was up to about here. By 1961, the base of the cliff was down about here. And you'll notice that this little black thing, right, running from there to there, and then it picks up again there. This is actually a stadia rod that shows you that this is five feet tall. This, the rod is basically wiped out uh, in the negative, but you can see a one-foot increment sitting about there. So that's about a five feet of soil loss on the edge of this field, probably mostly due to tillage erosion, but also somewhat to, to wind and, and rain. Uh, but this loss of five feet of soil in 50 years translates into a loss of about a foot a year, which is about an I'm sorry, about a foot a decade, which is about an inch a year. And if you look at the pace at which soils form globally, there's nowhere on Earth that soils are forming at a pace of an inch a year. Um, that's, it's an, uh, so you should be sitting there going, yeah, well, that's an extreme example. Uh, and yeah, it is. That's why I like to show it. Uh, but extreme examples don't make a solid case. So one of the things I wanted to do in researching the DIRT book was to compile additional data on both contemporary and long-term or geological erosion rates and on agricultural erosion rates in particular to try and ask the question of, um, if, is the pace of agricultural soil loss enough that it could explain the, the time scale of that periodicity in the graph from classical Greece and the magnitude of, of soil erosion in the American Southeast? Does this all kind of pencil out, in other words? Um, and what I did is something that is 
gotten very difficult to convince uh, students to do anymore, frankly, uh, and that is I went to the library. I just went and I parked and I gathered up all the data that I could find on what are rates of agricultural soil loss ar around the world from conventionally plowed fields and what are rates of long-term geological erosion because if you're going to maintain soil on the landscape over the long period haul, those long-term geological erosion rates give you an estimate of the long-term rates of soil production because over if we have geological time to play with, if those aren't balanced, you won't have any soil. The soil won't be maintained or it'll be built up so thick that um, it would it would be an incredible pile. But you look at the UN Global Soil Database, there's on average one to three feet of soil around the world, uh, and we've got tens of thousands of years since the last ice age. So the argument that geological erosion rates and soil production rates should be balanced is a pretty good one, and I'll show you some data on that in a minute that confirms it. But the point here is that I compiled about 1,400 and some odd uh, measurements of erosion from both agricultural settings and from the, the long-term background against which we could compare that to. And you'll notice that I, I did not use any universal soil loss equation-based model studies. Um, I just wanted to actually use uh, real measurements, point measurements on the ground um, of, of, of erosion. And you'll notice that naturally erosion rates span about seven orders of magnitude from down here at a tenth of a millimeter, fractions of a tenth of a millimeter a year at the low end, uh, up to the gorge of the Tsangpo River over here at about two centimeters a year, the most rapidly eroding place on Earth. So it spans quite a range. And I've, I've organized the geological data into three categories, cratons, soil mantled terrain, and alpine or glaciated terrain. Those cratons are the flat, dead parts of continents. They're the areas that um, are like, uh, like most of Africa, Australia, uh, the heart of the American continent, the Midwest, places that tend to be low relief, fairly flat, um, fairly earthquake-free. Um, and then and those places erode at rates up to about a tenth of a millimeter a year. I'm sorry, 101% of a millimeter a year. The soil mantle terrain here in the middle are places that actually are like um, the Piedmont, like the hills of classical Greece, places where you have uh, significant topography and up to steep slopes, but they're covered with soil. And, and those range up to erosion rates on the order of a millimeter a year or so. So you can think of long-term soil production rates in the areas that we actually farm, these soil-mantled uh, air landscapes and cratons, as places where the soil is being produced at less than a, about a millimeter a year. If you look at places that have erosion rates higher than that over the long run, they're the alpine and glaciated terrain, real mountains, things like the Cascades, the Alps in Europe, the Himalaya, the Andes, um, places that don't tend to have a lot of soil at their surface and that tend to erode fairly fast. Now look at the data from agriculture. And what I mean by agriculture here is uh, conventional plow-based agriculture. And those erosion rates range from a fraction of a millimeter a year up to, you know, pushing a, um, uh, pushing a uh, tenth of a meter a year. Um, but if you play the game of which of these natural long-term erosion rates do the conventional agriculture rates uh, pencil out at, you basically come to the conclusion that we've managed to convert um, the places that we farm uh, in this world, places like Nebraska and Tennessee, into places that are eroding like the high Himalaya and the Andes. And that's a fairly, you know, this is through the thick glasses of a geologist and a brute force global data compilation. Um, results will vary by farm and environment, obviously. But the basic story here is that we've basically accelerated rates of soil erosion um, in a way that would be unsustainable. Uh, and this shows you that same data viewed in a slightly different format. What I've got here are percentile plots, and I've added a couple other data sets. So we've got probability distributions for geological erosion rates. Uh, that's the black line in through here. Um, and then the conventional agriculture dates, the black, those black dots, those, that's the same data that I showed you on the previous graph, but just presented in a different way, where you can see each data point in, in all these compilations. Um, and you know, you read the average value as the 50th percentile up and over to get the rate. But the point that I really want to make here is that when you add data on soil production rates, the little circles, the white circles, dates, uh, rates of erosion under native vegetation, the little white triangles, and rates of erosion under conservation agriculture, the little white diamonds, they all plot pretty much on top of that long-term geological soil erosion rate. In other words, this leads to the conclusion that agricultural soil loss is not because we farm, but it arises from how we farm.
conventional plow-based agriculture is the outlier, sitting up here well above long-term rates of soil erosion, soil replacement, soil production, and well above rates of soil erosion under conservation agriculture. And this I like to call the good news slide because it suggests that we have access to agricultural practices that um, would not result in long-term loss of the soil. The problem, of course, is that those are not practices that are conventional in the sense of widely adopted throughout our agricultural um, settings. Now, if we basically try and take one more look at that data before I move on to um, thinking about tying it back to um, the main thrust of the dirt book, we can look at the different kinds of averages that we have in both um, in, in distributions like this. Whether you like the median or the mean, these are not Gaussian distributions, so I'll show you both averages because it really doesn't matter to the point that I want to make. If we look at the, the average rate of erosion under conventional plow-based agriculture globally, it's somewhere north of a millimeter a year. Um, you know, whether it's a millimeter and a half, four millimeters, let's just call it north of a millimeter a year. And compare that with all these blue numbers, rates of erosion, the average rate under conservation agriculture, which the data was mostly no-till agriculture, uh, native vegetation from around the world, rates of soil production, and very long-term geological erosion rates, those are all in terms of fractions of a tenth of a millimeter a year. So however you cut this data, um, there's a very big difference between the long-term erosion rates under conventional agriculture and uh, the rates at which soil is being produced or which, um, for which we could lose it under conservation agriculture. So. Any way you cut this, there's more than a millimeter a year difference between erosion rates under conventional agriculture and rates of soil production. So if we play that out and we sort of look at, well, what does that mean for the longevity of societies? We can do a very simple calculation where we look at the net loss of the soil uh, of about a millimeter a year or so implies that erosion of a typical half meter to one meter thick hill slope soil, you know, a foot to three feet of soil on a hillside, would only take about 500 to 1,000 years. And if you look at through the, back through the archaeological record and you parse for different regions, that's about the lifespan of most major civilizations with one really big caveat, and that's outside of major river floodplains. So it wouldn't apply to things like the Tigris and Euphrates, the, the Yellow River, the alluvial rivers in China, the Indus, the Brahmaputra, the Nile, the places where human civilizations have lasted the longest as contiguous civilizations are places where erosion of the uplands from those environments feeds the floodplain agriculture and refreshes soil fertility on an annual basis in those environments. And some of them had problems with salinity that I talk about in the book as well. But uh, the, the key here to me is that this periodicity that we saw in that Greek landscape in terms of three societies occupying the same uh, um, landscape, that cycle of taking 500 to 1,000 years to erode through the soil and then it taking you know a couple thousand years to, to build it back, uh, the numbers kind of pencil out at looking at that's not a crazy hypothesis to actually think about in terms of what's controlling the longevity of societies. Now, this idea that uh, the way people treat soils uh, affects the longevity of societies, again, is not new. Plato talked about it, but so did Franklin Delano Roosevelt back in 1937 in the aftermath of the Dust Bowl. He wrote in a letter to the, the governors of the then all 48 states uh, that a nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. And I think that those words are as true today as they were back then, but they have greater pertinence on a global stage because we've made great strides in this country at reducing the pace of soil erosion. We still, I think, have a ways to go in terms of reducing soil degradation, but, um, but your agency in particular has been very effective since the Dust Bowl at trying to crank down the rate at which American fields are eroding. You go around the world, um, and it can be a bit of a different story. Um, so this, of course, motivates the question of, is soil restoration possible? Could we reverse that historical pattern, and could we do it at a large scale? Uh, and that's the question that we started to wrestle with in The Hidden Half of Nature. This shows you my hands holding our soil uh, that on our lot in North Seattle. This is what we started with. This is where we have today about 15 years later. You'll notice there's a, a bit of a color difference between those soils. We've done, um, it was an experiment that in soil building that I'll describe a little bit, but that has roots in previous efforts. Because we can look back at some societies, um, particularly um, the Dutch uh, that built the famous Plagen soils out of uh, marine sands, where by returning organic matter to their soil, they built up some of the most uh, fertile land in Europe. And we can look at the Terra Preta soils of the Amazon, uh, where 
the native soil is not terribly fertile, but through, uh, through building up carbon-rich soils, human activity actually greatly accelerated the pace of soil building to the point where the best so agricultural soil today in the Amazon is located in the regions that had the highest abor aboriginal population density, where the best soils, in other words, are where the most people were. So the idea that human societies need to um, mine their soil to, to persist is demonstrably wrong. There are societies that have built fertile soil through agricultural their agricultural activities, and this is something that um, my wife and co-author on The Hidden Half of Nature uh, and I really learned for ourselves in our yard when we bought a, um, a house in North Seattle. And what this did through the, through the digression that I'll share with you uh, is that it, it, it brought to our attention the role of this invisible world of nature that we call the hidden half of nature, the microbial world, uh, the world that ranges down from the smallest or pieces of living things, DNA and viruses, all the way up to the red blood cells, the giants of the, of the microbial world. And you notice that the range in sizes of things in the invisible half of nature, things smaller than about a tenth of a millimeter, that range in sizes, it's about five orders of magnitude, that's the same size range as we have in the visible part of nature, from amoebas all the way up to people. And the title of the book, The Hidden Half of Nature, is, is not um, facetious. If we looked at the total mass of microbial life in the world, it would rival the total mass of the nature that we can know and see and look and, and, and kick over and study. And as a geolo uh, biologist, I'm a geologist. We train to study this visible world of nature. But through the process of restoring the soil in our yard, we really came to appreciate the role that this invisible hidden half plays in driving the dynamics that support life above ground. Um, this shows you our landscape, uh, our yard. Uh, when we peeled back the, the lawn, we bought a 1918 house in North Seattle. I should have dug a soil pit when we bought it. My wife wanted a garden. I didn't think to do that. She didn't think to do that. When we finally peeled the lawn off to actually try and put a garden in, we found out we had glacial till. Uh, it's essentially nature's concrete. It was um, sand, silt, and gravel, and boulders that were compressed between, beneath a mile-high wall of ice that overran North Seattle. It doesn't look like the world's best soil to grow things in. Well, watch this uh, um, roof line of the house uh, behind us. It'll come back in a few slides. Um, so we realized. Um, that we had the geology part of soil, but we didn't have the biology part. part. And the, the thing that David said about Ray talking about, you know, soil without biology is just geology, well, that's what we had in our yard. Um, and we basically decided we needed to add the biology. So we started adding organic matter in all the forms that we could get it, and painted a wheelbarrow up with, with racing stripes, and we started um, adding uh, oak leaves, wood chips, uh, as much organic matter as we could find. And what we found is that after about six years, this, this slide shows you her pruning shears, uh, with the pit that we dug in the soil about six years into doing very intensive composting and mulching in the yard. And you'll notice that um, we've still got you know, crappy till down here. We've got all the organic matter we've added at the surface up here. But notice we've got about two inches of actual real soil that just was not there when we pulled the lawn off. And you notice that the, tree, the plant roots are getting down just about to the interface between the soil and, um, and the till. We were able to build two inches of soil in about six years. That's almost four inches a decade. I mean, this is off the charts in terms of the pace at which nature builds soil. And this was a real revelation to me in terms of the, the degree to which how we treat the surface of the earth, what we put on it, uh, and the role of organic, that we could build soils not just from the bottom up, by converting rocks into soil, but that we could build them from the top down by adding organic matter to integrate that with the soil. And to me, that was a, a big sort of change in perspective. And notice this is that same uh, neighbor's roof line, um, again, about six, eight years into um, our transformation of our garden. And fixing the soil below ground, reseeding the microbial life that was driving the nutrient cycling in the below ground environment really fostered an explosion of life above ground that led to a radical transformation of how we actually see and use our yard. And a lot of that uh, boiled down to the effect of uh, exudates in the rhizosphere. Now, as a geologist, looking at the rhizosphere and thinking about plant roots as actually 
pumping carbon-rich substances out into the soil was, was a bit novel to me. This is not what I was taught in terms of soils and soil fertility. Um, but it was fascinating to learn about this rich zone of microbial life around the, the, that forms a living halo around the roots of plants and the way that plants will push out 30 to 40 percent, in some cases, of the material that they fix through photosynthesis out of their root systems and into the soil. And it makes kind of no sense about why a plant would do that unless there's a purpose for it. And it turns out that that purpose is to feed that rich population of microbial life in the rhizosphere. And plants wouldn't be bothering to do this if it didn't. They plant the microbial life didn't provide something in return. And as we looked into this process and started reading the, the microbiological literature uh, in terms of uh, the relationship between plants, their roots, um, and the microbes in the soil, we really learned that that idea that the plant roots are not just straws sucking up material from the soil, but it's a two-way street across which plant exudates are moving out of the root systems and into the rhizosphere to feed the microbes in the soil that basically consume the, all those um, carbon-rich goodies and their metabolites, their waste products, are taken back up by the plants and help nourish the plants. What kind of metabolites are they producing? I was shocked when I learned that uh, the microbes in the rhizosphere are producing things like plant growth promoting hormones. Why would a microbe produce a plant growth promoting hormone? Well, it's to basically help nourish its sugar mama that's capturing solar energy pushing sugars out into the soil uh, and helping to feed those microbes. The microbes have an interest in keeping the plant healthy, and the plant has an interest in keeping the microbes healthy. It's essentially a symbiosis. Uh, fungal hyphae that actually connect up to plant roots end up going off and prospecting into mineral soil to actually bring nutrients to plant roots. Uh, they're bringing things like phosphorus, things like all the micronutrients that plants need to grow. Um, a lot of things that simply aren't in the fertilizers that we're so used to applying in our agricultural environments. It was the mycorrhizal fungi that were actually um, providing those to a lot of plants. Um, another thing that I was very fascinated to learn in looking into these connections was the idea that when above ground pests, like this little guy here, start chewing on the leaves of plants, those plants can push exudates out of their root system into the soil to try and grow the populations of microbes in the rhizosphere whose metabolites um, are taken back up by the plant and that actually make the plant taste bad to the pests and help repel those pests. In other words, this sort of different view of the relationship between plants, the root systems, and the life in the soil, the microbes growing around those roots, um, leads us to characterize this relationship as plants have sort of offshored, they've outsourced uh, some of their basic chemical defense mechanisms to the microbes in the rhizosphere. And their way of actually harnessing that is by feeding the appropriate microbes. Um, in other words, there's these partnerships in the soil that are, um, can help explain some of the, the phenomena that we see. In, in part, one of those phenomena is how fertilization can affect uh, the growth of plant roots and the production of plant exudates and how that in turn influences microbial life in the rhizosphere. If we look at an experiment done in Vermont with 100-day-old tomato plants, with, this is actually about a, uh, a two feet uh, section through here. Uh, with no fertilization, the roots look like this. Conventionally fertilized, you've got far less roots. Essentially, the plant gets relatively lazy. If, if you're providing it with nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium, it doesn't need to actually build as extensive a root system to try and capture those kinds of nutrients um, through the interactions with the rhizosphere. Um, a composted manure system, you get a much greater and denser uh, growth of plant roots in part because those roots are, um, that those nutrients in the composted manure are not immediately accessible and they're, the plant is putting out, growing roots and putting out exudates to grow the microbes that will then break down the compost and release the nutrients to take back up. In other words, the diet that a plant eats, what it's provided with in the soil, whether it's a fertilizer-rich diet or an organic matter-rich diet, will actually influence the degree to which that plant will engage with the microbial community to, um, to, and that will affect its ability to draw up other micronutrients. The last thing about our, the experiment in our yard that I'd like to share with you all um, is an observation that I made sort of late in the game. Uh, and that is that, the, the, that life came back to our yard in about the same order as which it evolved on Earth, um, without, of course, the dinosaurs. Uh, 
but that microbial life uh, was the, the foundation that fueled an explosion of life above ground. If we look at the timeline from about 540 million years here down to about 145 million years at the bottom, and we just look at how bacteria arrived and plants arrived, then, then uh, um, detritivores arrived, then herbivores, ferns, reptiles. If you substitute crows for dinosaurs, we're on, on track there, and then mammals, birds. Um, that same order of life coming back to the yard uh, is the order which life evolved on the continents. And I think what that's telling us is that there's some very fundamental relationships in which microbial life sets the foundation for building the ecosystems in the soil that in turn support the ecosystems above ground. Now while this was all happening, uh, Anne and I were, were pretty fascinated by microbial life. Uh, the role of archaea, bacteria, protists, viruses, and fungi, the big players in the microbial world. And at this point, we were pretty fascinated with, with what they could do to boost the fertility of the soil in our yard and support life uh, in our yard. But we got thrown a curveball um, in that while we were putting this story together, Anne was diagnosed with a, a microbially caused cancer. And she's about five years post-surgery. She's pretty much through that uh, phase of her life now, thankfully. But it made us start thinking about and looking into what's the role and influence of microbial life on human health and our own health. And at this time, the discoveries about the human microbiome uh, were exploding. And we didn't realize how much they would parallel what we were learning about the soil microbiome. But if we look at the human microbiome, uh, and we can look at in terms of the number of our cells, we're, there's about as many microbial cells in our bodies as there are human cells. We're sort of half human, half microbially, it, microbial if you look at the total number of cells in our bodies. If you look at the number of genes in our bodies, we have about 23,000 human genes. If you look at all the microbial genes that are doing things in our bodies, there's millions of them, five or six million. We're wildly outnumbered in terms of genetic diversity within our own bodies. This led us into starting to think about, well, what's the, what are the role of microbes in uh, maintaining human health? We, we know about the role of pests and pathogens. We all get colds every now and then. But some of the discoveries in the recent microbial world have looked at the relationship between microbes and the human immune system through a very different lens. And I'll relate this back to the soil in a couple minutes, but there's some really interesting and key parallels here that, um, frankly, I found really surprising, uh, but I think are very informative and illuminating. So this leads us to a place that none of us really like to talk about, the human colon. Uh, it's sort of the bottom end of our, of our digestive system. And if you take a look at the human colon through a cross-section and blow it up, you get something like this down here. Why would you look at the human colon? Something like 80% of your immune system, of your immune tissue, is wrapped around the colon, almost like an envelope around the colon. And if you look at you know, 80% or so of your, of your microbiome, the, 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 the microbes native to your own body live within the human colon. And it turns out that when you actually read the, the gastroenterology literature, which we were subjected to in, in researching this book, you find out that these, there's these cells called goblet cells that produce mucus that goes out and lines the colon. And some of the terms that the gastroenterologists use are very parallel to what was being used in the soil world. Uh, they refer to these uh, as exudates that essentially line the colon, and there's bacteria that live within those, the, the, the mucus layer uh, and that consume and eat those exudates. There's a parallel with the root system there. And the parallels get even more interesting um, when we look at blowing up a cross-section across the human colon. So there's the lining of the colon cells there. Um, there's these particular immune cells called dendritic cells that will stick a little arm up through the lining of the colon and sample either the microbes in the mucus or actually in the lumen where the stuff is going through. Um, and why are they doing this? They take those samples, which are called antigen, and they bring them back and share them, show them to their pals, uh, these immune cells called T cells. And this turns out to be absolutely central to how your immune system works because those, those, um, those samples, the antigen that the dendritic cells show to the T cells are the key to activating the T cells. T cells just sit there um, as inactive thing, cells not doing anything until they're presented with the right antigen that spurs them into activity, and they'll either be triggered as pro-inflammatory T17 cells, or if they have different antigen, they may be triggered as anti-inflammatory T regulatory cells. 
In other words, it turns out that which microbes are in your colon influence the balance between inflammation and quelling inflammation in your immune system. In other words, the information in the microbiota in your colon is informing your immune system as to whether to, to uh, lead to inflammation and fire it up or to quell it and crank it down. And this is, there's a hypothesis as that, this, that the change in the human gut microbiota may have actually influenced the rise of chronic diseases in the second half of the 20th century. We're all familiar with how the incidence of infectious diseases decreased in the 20th century thanks to things like antibiotics and better sanitation. What we haven't had a really good explanation for yet is why the commensurate increase in um, autoimmune disorders and, um, uh, and chronic diseases. And this hypothesis um, it has been hypothesized that that is due to changes in uh, the human microbiota um, through either antibiotics or through changes in our diet. Uh, how does the diet connection work? Well, we've got to take a very brief detour through the human digestive tract to, to illustrate that. But basically, the, the idea is that if you look at the human digestive tract from the stomach, the small intestine, and the colon, uh, the number of microbes in the stomach is very small because it's very acidic. There's a few in the small intestine, but our colon is actually the center of our microbial diversity. Um, and you know, there's uh, hundreds of millions of, of microbes per milliliter of fluid in the colon, greatly outnumbering what's in the stomach. And if you look at what happens in these different organs, the stomach dissolves things. The small intestine absorbs the things that were there dissolved in the stomach. This is where the proteins and the fats and the simple sugars get absorbed into your body. The colon, it turns out, is a fermentation tank. All those plant foods that are really hard to digest, that we don't actually have the enzymes to break down, end up in our colons. And that's where the microbes in our colon, with their extra several million genes, they have the ability to break down those complex carbohydrates, things that your doctor calls fiber. And what they do with that fiber is actually something that is nothing short of, of miraculous in terms of, of um, what it does for our own health. So if we look at fiber coming into the human colon, it has, there's different words for it, lots of different forms. It gets consumed by our microbiota in our colons. They're, they're metabolites, they're waste products, produce things like butyrate. Why am I going to focus on butyrate? Well, it turns out butyrate is what nourishes the cells that line the colon. Um, most of the cells in your body are fed by your blood. Uh, colon cells are different. They're nourished primarily by butyrate, which is produced by microbes that are consuming and fermenting the fiber that is in our diet. The other things that butyrate does is that when those dendritic cells sample it as antigen and show it to T cells, it triggers the T regulatory cells, which are the inflammation blocking cells. So in other words, if you eat a diet that's high in fiber, uh, it will nourish your colon lining and stand down your immune system um, rather than firing it up in a chronically inflamed situation. This is a totally different way of looking at how the immune system relates to microbes. I was always under the impression that you know microbes were um, you know disease-causing organisms and pests and pathogens, um, but it turns out that there are having the right microbes in that environment actually benefits the health of people, much like the way having the right microbes in the root zone of a plant benefits the health of plants. Well, how might this have influenced our um, our health over the 20th century? Well, if we just look at the, the total carbohydrate consumption from 1910 to 1997, uh, we ate about we ate about the same amount now in terms of total carbohydrates as we did then. It's just in a completely different form. Early in the century, we ate mostly unprocessed whole grains, high carbohydrate, high fiber diet. We now eat a high carbohydrate, low fiber diet. Um, mostly uh, processed grains where the, the bran and the fiber part of the grains has been separated from the rest of what goes into the diet. And there's a whole slew of um, maladies for which a connection has been suggested uh, due to changes in the, um, in the human microbiome. Some of these are, have been demonstrated to be causal at this point. Others, it's correlative. Uh, the point we make in the hidden half is that over the next couple decades, there's going to be a lot of revolutionary science in terms of how changes in the human microbiome has affected public health. And what I really wanted to get to was that at this point in researching the book, Ann and I had this big sort of uh, aha in terms of if we think about the root and the gut as organs of animals, plants and animals respectively, um, they're kind of the same thing inside out. 
if we look at roots, the exudates are feeding the root microbiome in the human gut. It's our own diet, and the mucus exudates from our colon lining are feeding um, our, our internal microbiome. And those microbes, in both cases, uh, help with nutrient acquisition and make metabolites that are critical to maintaining the health of both in plants and in people. Um, and it's based on making them from organic matter in the soil and from our diet in our gut, a different kind of organic matter. And if we look at the way the micro microbes are influencing plant defense and our own immune system, there's this communication that's going on, chemical communication going on between the host organism and the microbiome. Um, and this perspective of leads us to a sort of a different view, I think, of both the soil in the outer world of nature and also in what Anne and I call our inner soil, the lining of our own gut. Um, and it suggests that maybe we need to think about soil in a different way. Um, and if we think about the role of back in the plant world uh, in terms of what it is that makes for a healthy diet for plant life, thinking about the role of these beneficial microbial metabolites uh, that are produced by the microbes that are fed by the organic matter in the soil, um, you get those into a plant diet uh, when you, the, you have a lot of organic matter for those microbes to process and break down. A, a fertilizer diet, sort of a conventional fertilizer diet, can provide a lot of the macronutrients, but you may not be getting as many of the micronutrients and those beneficial microbial metabolites that we can get by feeding a soil a soil life diet. Um, and we go into those connections in terms of how, um, how those things work in the book, and we go a lot farther into looking at what it means for the, the human diet, what we should all be eating. Um, but the basic message boils down to um, thinking about mulching your soil inside or out. Um, and the last thing that I want to share with you all, since we're closing in on the end of the hour here, um, is that if you look at how to actually apply uh, that idea of trying to cultivate the beneficial microbes in the soil with what we called the soil life diet. Um, how would you go about operationalizing that in agriculture? And I spent the last year from April till September visiting farms around the world that were applying the principles of conservation agriculture as the FAO uh, defines them, which involve three basic principles, uh, minimal or no soil disturbance, things like no-till, the direct planting of seeds, maintaining a permanent ground cover and retaining crop residues that, and including cover crops in crop rotations, and then using diverse rotations uh, to, main, to help break up pathogen carryover and maintain fertility. Um, and I basically visited people like Dwayne Beck in, um, in South Dakota, Kofi Boa in Ghana, um, David uh, Brandt over here on the right, Gabe Brown over here on the left uh, in both in um, Ohio and North Dakota, respectively, and um, visited Rattan Lau at Ohio State University, uh, where he showed me his long-term effects of applying conservation agricultural principles to his soil trials with the, un the sort of before over there, uh, whoops, where's my, before over here on the left with the sort of the light yellowish soil, the dark soil on the right with 20 years of, of no-till and, um, and uh, organic amendments. Big difference in the soil. Um, and I'm writing that stuff up right now. I need to finish the book by June to deliver to my publisher. It'll come out next spring. But the basic idea is that these ideas of conservation agriculture really do work to restore soil in intensive production um, environments. Uh, and they're scalable from small-scale subsistence farms in Africa right on up to big operations uh, in the U.S. And I kind of want to emphasize that, that I think that we're, we're missing the boat to some degree with a lot of the arguments around sort of GMO versus organic agriculture. I think that the, the biggest room for really rapid progress is prioritizing thinking about soil health in terms of our um, framing of how to look at uh, agricultural practices and looking at conservation agriculture as a way to do it and reframe the argument uh, as, as around not a question of a difference between low-tech organic versus high-tech GMO with, um, approaches, but to focus on the real question, which I think is how to apply the understanding of soil ecology and soil building to the applied problem of profitably sustaining high crop yields in the coming post-cheap oil environment. Um, I think there's room for great optimism and progress here. The, the people that I was visiting uh, who are putting these principles into practice um, 
use different techniques uh, on their farms. They're all very different. They've but they've greatly reduced their reliance on agrochemicals. Uh, none of them, well, one exception, I went to the Rodale Institute. They were the only organic uh, producers that I visited. But all these places had maintained their yields while greatly reducing their inputs and thereby made their farms more profitable. Um, and so as a final point, I think there's some side benefits from restoring healthy soils, um, and those are that – it can actually help us feed the world in the post-oil environment, maintain yields with fewer inputs. It can help sequester carbon in the soil. There's a whole other talk we could do about that, but the potential is huge. And it can help us conserve biodiversity on that quarter of the continents that are agricultural lands, um, which will be greatly important in the future. So I'll, I'll leave you there uh, since I think we're running up right into the top of the hour and I managed to actually do this on time. Um, apologize for talking fairly fast, but uh, if you're interested in following the stuff that Ann and I are, are following up on, on the relationship between microbial life in the soil and, our, and in the human gut and their connections and parallels, um, we're on Twitter at dig to grow uh, Our website's up there, too, and obviously I encourage you all to uh, check out and read the books and stay tuned for the next one. I think if we have time, I'd be happy to engage with any questions. Okay. Thank you, Dave. That was uh... – <laughs> I guess I'm a, I'm hope everybody else is blown away as I am. That's a great connection between soil, healthy soils, mean healthy food, mean healthy people. I think that's just a great connection you made there. And I got a couple questions, and uh, again, I encourage folks to to get the books because I've read uh, I haven't read the second one, but I have read Dirt and looked at it several times. But there was a question, kind of going back a little bit to when you redid your garden. Any idea about how much organic matter you were talking about having to add to get those kind of uh, <laughs> changes, you know, and not to give it to us in pounds for, for acre, not wheelbarrows per uh. <laughs> <laughs> wheelbarrows per season. You know, yeah, I, would yeah. love, I would love to be able to give you numbers on that, but, you know, the honest answer is we didn't do a controlled science experiment on the yard. It was something that uh, Ann started and called it her organic matter crusade. Uh, we, we put a lot of organic matter into the yard, and I think that's why we were able to do it so fast, um, a big part of it. There's, you know, it's, there's a lot of uh, uh, coffee shops in Seattle. They all put their coffee grounds out behind the, their, their places. There's, there's a lot of trees that get chipped up. So we, we had a lot of nitrogen-rich and carbon-rich sources we were able to put back into the soil, and we also used a lot of our own uh, worm compost out of our, out of our kitchen. So, it, you know, in terms of the rate at which we are doing it, I'm not sure. We may uh, be fairly fast. I, what I can tell you about is how much we changed the carbon content of our soil. Unfortunately, I can't tell you how much carbon we had to put on to do it uh, because we're not that controlled. But we did recently uh, go through and look at the carbon content in different parts of the soil. And the part of the yard that we did not restore, sort of a bit out behind the garage, had the original carbon content of about a percent and a half. Most of the planting beds now are up to about 5 or 6%. Um, some are a little higher. And the vegetable beds, which got the majority of the worm compost, are up to about 11 or 12% uh, carbon. Um, so we've, we've basically sequestered a lot of carbon in the yard, but we had access to, to large amounts of organic matter. Um, and, you know, we, we applied a lot early on, and then it tapered off. And we're now at the point where... The, the yard itself generates enough organic matter to, to mulch and cover the bed so we're not adding it anymore. We've sort of built yeah. it up. Sounds like you have quite a variety of carbon C into ratios. Not all organic matter or organic yep. materials the same. Yep, and we didn't we didn't control for it. It was not much of a science experiment yeah. uh, in terms of the yard. It was an eye opener for me in terms of the yeah. potential to do it. But what was what I think was the much better controlled experiment were all these farmers that I visited. Um, I was incredibly impressed with, with what they were able to do, and, and the changes in the carbon content of their soils kind of mirror what happened in our yard. You brought up the idea of uh, having uh, that, that uh, the change followed an evolutionary pattern, and we talk about creating habitat, and, and it'll come. Can you talk a little bit about, more about that, How what you noticed as far as the change in the bacteria to the higher you know, developed organisms, that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we did early on that I didn't talk about here is that Anne started applying soil soup. She put it, you know, spraying microbes in the yard, and so she was trying to rebuild and reseed the microbes at, at the start. And it took about three or four years before we really started to see sort of changes in the soil with it starting to get darker, and we were growing that layer uh, beneath the the organic matter. 
And I started thinking about, well, you know, what, how is this organic matter breaking down so fast? What's happening to it? Where is it going? Um, and we actually couldn't obviously see the microbes that came back at the start. But um, it was the, the progression that we saw come in after we reseeded that uh, was pretty noticeable in terms of the, um, the, the detritivores that would come in, then the, the, arachnid, the detritivores and the arachnids, and then the, the, the worms, and then the larger things eating them, and then the birds eating the worms, and then the eagles eating the birds. Um, that whole order was um, pretty parallel. So I, I think you can think of it in terms of there's the kind of diagrams that like uh, of the soil food web that people like Elaine Ingram will show. Um, where you've got the, the microbes are feeding the sort of the next level up. Everybody's feeding the next level up. Mm -hmm. So you can think of the microbial life as the foundation that is actually sort of the critical linchpin between taking that organic matter and recycling it back into um, its sort of the native components, if you will, the building blocks for, for further life. It's sort of the, the most broken down point is when that stuff gets back into the microbes and then the microarthropods and the and the nematodes eat them and excrete the sort of the, the, the nutrient really nutrient rich micro manure that is the foundation then for the soil food web. Okay. Well, listen. We appreciate your time, David. It's been very informative. I think I'm going to cut the questions off now. Uh, encourage folks to get the books. Uh, there are others out there. Another one, Farm Ecology, with Dr. Uh, Daphne Miller. Is another one that talks more about that interaction between food and human health. And I, I just really think that 10 years from now, we're going to be thinking that, you know, it's going to be so obvious, so why didn't we think about this before? So anyway, I, with that, I, I totally want to write uh, about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully we'll get, we continue to, to see this change. Because the one thing I, I, I told David when I asked him to do this, his book depressed me because there wasn't, you know, just constant civilization after civilization falling because they didn't learn from history. And I, hopefully that we can – become wise enough to learn from our mistakes, and then with this new concept of understanding the ecosystem that we're all part of and building that in, that not only how we eat the food, but how we produce it and the impact it has on our bodies, I think is going to lead to a more optimistic future. At least I, I feel that way. So with that, I want to thank you and uh, just say good day to everybody and have a, have a pleasant evening. Thank you much, David.